I'm really happy and proud that we can announce two other great speakers. So please give a warm applause for Adam Ludwin, the co-founder and CEO of Chain, and Jed McCallip from Stellar. Please. So, um, Adam and Jed, you're up here together today because uh, both of your organizations help financial institutions issue assets onto cryptographic networks. So Adam Chain has focused on private networks and Jed Stellar has focused on doing this over a public network. Can you each talk about your approaches and why uh, you picked the strategy you did? Jed, you go first, and then Adam, please. Sure. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so the, the idea behind Stellar is we're trying to build an internet-level protocol for payments to connect all these different financial institutions and payment networks together. And <clears throat> the thing that blockchain brings to that is that it gives you this uh, public ledger that everyone can see, but no one can change arbitrarily. And what that allows you to do is have... Uh, entities that don't necessarily know each other or trust each other still be able to transact, right? And so by its very nature, in order to facilitate that, you need some sort of public chain, right? You need, you need this, this thing that everyone can see uh, and that institutions all over the world can connect to and, and, and still be able to transact, very much the, the way like SMPT, SMPT and uh, other, other internet-level protocols work, so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Hi, and, um, so, hi, everyone. My name is Adam, um, and I'm with Chain. And uh, we've taken almost the exact opposite approach uh, to Stellar, uh, but with an eye toward the same ultimate uh, goal. Uh, and I think these, these two approaches ultimately can converge. Um, we've decided to think about like the asset first, meaning uh, if we want securities or currencies to run over a network, like Stellar's network or other, uh, other public networks, what do we have to do inside the enterprise to start uh, e sort of uh, extracting those assets from the old clunky systems of record and the old financial rails that they run on today and put them into a cryptographic medium, even if that means that ledger is local to that institution or local to three or four different institutions? in much the same way that you saw sort of as a precursor to the internet, um, local networking between and within organizations. And so most of Chain's technology to date has been, you know, for lack of a better uh, expression, you know, cryptographic databases that tokenize those assets and essentially prepare them for a future where uh, institutions are, are connected over public, public blockchains. Um, and, uh, and that's always motivated us, and I think we share um, Jed's vision for a future where payments move seamlessly over the internet. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So first, um, Jed, regarding Stellar, there are many public blockchains, and sometimes it's really hard uh, for newcomers to differentiate between them. So tell us about what Stellar is specifically designed for, and uh, give some example, if you can, of how people are using it today. Sure, yeah. Yeah, there are uh, like, uh, uh, like a whole cornucopia of things that people do with this blockchain concept, and they do get lumped together, but it's important to realize that they're all serving pretty different niches, and they're not necessarily competitive, and there won't be like one thing that, that will solve all use cases. Uh, Stellar is designed, like I said, mainly to facilitate cross-border payments. So it's, it's, you know, basically the idea is to be sort of uh, like email is for information, this will be f uh, this is a protocol for, for sending value, right? So you, what, what that means is you can store any kind of tokenized representation in there. So uh, dollars or euros or Thai bot uh, can be represented inside the network and it turns those into a digital currency. So it turns, so now a, a dollar token inside Stellar can be sent just as easily as Bitcoin is sent around, uh, you know, things like this, right? So, um, so it has that aspect, and then it also has this uh, distributed exchange inside the network because not everybody wants to use the same currency, right? If I'm here and I want to send money to somebody in Mexico, they want to receive pesos and though I want to send dollars. So you need to have an exchange inside the network that can swap between these different assets. So it has this built-in distributed exchange, and this allows 
uh, everything to be interoperable because that's that's the main that's the main goal is to make all these different forms of value interoperable, um, and those are kind of the big differentiators from between Stellar and a lot of other like uh, blockchain projects is uh, are those two things like it can hold other assets. There's an exchange between them, uh, and, and also we made the thing very scalable because it's tailored just for that that's use important. case. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. So, um, Adam. You, your work with Visa on commercial payments um, is similar to use case I could imagine seeing um, on Stellar. So um, do you imagine companies like Visa will ever use a public blockchain like Stellar? And um, why? Yeah, good question. And I, I think building on uh, Jed's description of Stellar, um, that vision is very similar to what not only Visa, but other, I guess, financial network incumbents have uh, latched onto around, uh, around, around cryptocurrencies and blockchains, recognizing this medium feels like the internet native medium for what we do, mm -hmm. and in many ways that can feel threatening. Um, but also companies like Visa that have been around for decades have shifted the medium of their business multiple times. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, in our work with Visa, we found that they were less like threatened uh, than you know opportunistic and sort of looking at it through an innovator's lens. Even though that is hard for incumbents to do, um, I will say between like 2014 and 2017, there was a reluctance to touch anything public blockchain related. Mm -hmm. um, and we found, even though when we started Chain. Uh, we, we actually, the very first thing we built was a, an API to make it easier to use the Bitcoin network. Um, uh, we found that uh, even uh, the only people willing to sort of use a service like that were startups and fintechs, uh, that the incumbents, the enterprise just wasn't ready. And so most of our efforts, like I said at the outset, were focused on helping them and kind of meeting them where they, they were at the time, you know, their willingness to build a network but in a permissioned environment. Mm -hmm. What's changed in the last 12 months is as they have both, and my, I mean Visa, but also the enterprise market generally, as they've, in, as they've built out kind of and prototyped and done pilots of permissioned networks, they've learned a lot. And they've also watched as the cryptocurrency or public network ecosystem has matured a lot. And I know sitting here and thinking, is cryptocurrency mature yet? Is it? And we just had a panel about how nobody knows anything about the law, and uh, that's all true. But we've come a long way from just a few years ago. You have to remember, where the only game in town was Bitcoin, and there was no way to put an asset on the Bitcoin network, really. You can, you can hack it and put it into the op return, but you can't really do anything scalable. Stellar launched the same time we launched Chain. You know, if Stellar was around when we were starting Chain, we probably would have just said, hey, why don't we take our clients to Stellar? Uh, but that wasn't the case then. So, uh, so here we are, and we've. Uh, so what we've seen now is both because of everything they've learned, and they've learned that there are fundamental limits to permissioned networks. It's not easy to add people later, for example, um, and because networks like Stellar and others have matured a lot in the last few years, there's a willingness to now finally in 2018 begin to sort of dip their toe. So I I would say. Um, I think you framed it at will, will they ever, not only will they ever, they're already uh, quietly, but certainly engaging with public networks the way they were quietly engaging with this notion of a private network a few years ago. And I, I think the two, private and public, are going to converge in a way that um, th that dichotomy is not going to be one we talk about at conferences in a couple of years. Okay, but yeah. yeah, please. I was going to say, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of our experience in, with dealing with IBM is that they originally started... Uh, this Hyperledger project, and it was very much a permissioned thing. And what they, I think what they've realized over time is that that only gets you so far. To really do anything real in the world, you need to be connected to this larger network because the whole benefit of this kind of technology is it allows you to transact with people you, you aren't in a tight network with. It allows you to transact with people you don't necessarily know, right? Yeah. And so that's why they're now kind of like reaching out to, to have, have like their Hyperledger thing connected to larger public network, which I think is what Chain is experiencing as well. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. So, when do you think that, I mean, that that's going to be on the place? So, Visa, are they like in two years, three years? Or what do you think? Is it going 
Yeah, so I won't, I won't um, speak specifically to the project we have with them, but I will say more broadly based on all of our conversations, including conversations on the capital market side, like with the NASDAQs of the world. Um, uh, if you look at the portfolio of experiments that are happening at the enterprise, two years ago it was 100% private networks. Mm -hmm. Last year, because of that boom in the market, there was a little bit of an engagement with public networks, usually on, the, on, a, uh, on a project that has to do with can we build like a trading desk or wealth management or something. Now, uh, it feels like it's, in some, some cases, 25%, in some cases, 50% of what's happening internally at the enterprise level is experimenting with public networks, whether that's Stellar or Ethereum or something else. So, or in some cases, trying to invent their own. Good luck. But um, that, uh, I didn't mean to point at the audience when I said good luck. Like, <laughs> you're the enterprise or something. Um, <laughs> We're all a family. So, so that's, that's kind of what we're seeing. Yeah, there's a shift okay. for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, Jet, last year, the Seller Foundation, which is a non-profit, um, helped form a for-profit called Lightyear. Mm -hmm. So what is Lightyear's mission, and how uh, is that different from the Stellar Foundation? Just that we... Sure, yeah. Some words. Uh, it, it, you, the analogy I often use is that it's the difference. It's a distinction between Linux Foundation and Red Hat, right? So Linux Foundation, much like the Stellar Foundation, maintains this core code base and makes sure it's, uh, you know, robust and keeps being developed over time. Uh, and, and Lightyear, which is somewhat like Red Hat, uh, provides services and support to the network. Because what we kind of found is that as, as the Stellar Network started to get traction and people were starting to build on top of it, they kept asking the foundation to provide service and support for them, but that's not really what it was set up to do, and it was kind of like, like pulling us away from what our mandate was. So there was this obvious opportunity and, and need by the ecosystem to create um, some entity that can like, can like uh, serve these financial institutions, right? Like help them through the integration and, and provide service and support post that, right? So that's basically what Lightyear was set up to do. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Can I ask you a follow-up question about that since you're here? <laughs> yeah. Um, so if I think about other examples within crypto, yeah. I won't name names, but there's examples where there are companies where like for all intents and purposes, the foundation and the company are the same. There are cases where they seem to be antagonistic, like there's a company that sort of has the mantle of we're the company for this network, but it's not even clear that the people that run the network like it. Right. So is there a right model? Like why that model that you described? Um, yeah, I mean, I, obviously there's lots of different ways you can slice this. It is even, even beyond crypto companies. You know, there's like Mozilla has a for-profit and a non-profit. Uh, right. You know, same with a lot of other, not like WordPress has the same thing. Uh, it, it's, for us, uh, we try to keep the entities as separate as possible. Uh, I'm the only one that works at both, but otherwise there's, pr there's a pretty clean separation. Um, SDF owns a small percentage of Lightyear, but that's ba basically the extent of the relationship. And that seems to be working well. I mean, you obviously want them to be collaborative. I mean, the, the mission of both entities is largely the same. They're just like working at it from two different angles. Like they both want the network to be successful, uh, but you don't want them to be the same entity, obviously. So, um, but it's, it's a little bit of a dance, so. Okay, yeah. so yeah. thank you. Um, we have just some minutes left, so last question to, to Adam. Sure. Um, given your experience building private networks, um, I'm curious if you are bullish on cryptocurrencies as an asset class, and what do you think Chain will ever have its own cryptocurrency? Will Chain have its own cryptocurrency? Yeah. So, um, yeah, one of the nice things about being in the blockchain space but not having a cryptocurrency to be like, you know, hawking, is that I've been able to be informed, but not biased. Mm. Um, and I'm long-term, I am quite bullish on cryptocurrencies. I think a lot of people think the crypto, that cryptocurrencies are the point. It's important to recognize that cryptocurrencies are not the point. Cryptocurrencies just enable mm. these networks to operate on a decentralized basis. Yes. The point is what the network is for. So we've heard from Stellar today, obviously, what they're building, this future of payments over the internet. That's a very clear vision. You know, Ethereum has a different vision around, let's build a world computer. Let's build a trustless cloud. Um, Bitcoin has a very, it's actually quite controversial. What is Bitcoin for? Mm -hmm. The first four words of the Bitcoin paper are commerce on the internet. Uh, but it's become something more akin to digital gold. But the point is, every, every one of these networks that's been successful 
has some purpose that people are latched onto. And the ones that are slowly maybe going away or losing value quickly are the ones that exist and you go to their websites and it's just all about how great they are relative to the other tokens, but not about what they're actually for. Yeah. So I'm bullish on the set of tokens that are enabling something truly unique and creating utility in the world, or at least aspiring to. And I'm quite bearish on the ones that, you know, basically have just tried to capitalize on a moment to, you know, issue and pump up a new, a new token and hold on to it. And so I think a, a, a positive and healthy sign would be if there was a divergence between uh, the token returns over time, right? If, in, in markets where everything is going up and then everything is going down, that's sort of a sign of mania and panic. But in a market where certain things are going up in value and other things are dropping in value, that's very healthy because now you know that investors are making deeper analysis on, uh, on what makes actual sense and what's having impact. So as a class, I'm very bullish on it. If you could buy an index, I think that index would do well. But I also think, unlike the very efficient stock market, if you can do some additional work and actually study and figure out what is this network producing in terms of fruit, that that... Uh, that's the best type of investment. Yeah. Okay. So I'm looking at the clock. Um, 20 minutes went like that. Yeah. So um, <laughs> Ted and them will be here also outside. If you have any questions for them, they're really happy to be here. That's also about the conference. That's what we want to do. So connect to them. Take the chance. <laughs>